We are now ready to continue our study in the book of Hebrews, and I encourage you once more to keep your Bible open and follow word for word if you want to get the most out of this. And again, I remind you that the book of Hebrews is very simple. It doesn't take a lot of explanation to understand what is here, just a good interpretive reading with understanding. And because the whole book is just one admonition to these Jewish believers who were under great persecution from their fellow Jews, and as a result, they were considering going back into Judaism, but yet this epistle is written to let them know that Christ and Christianity is far superior to Judaism, and it is in many ways. And we're seeing in the first section of the book, the first, little better than half of it actually, that Christ, the founder of Christianity, is the spirit of the founders of Judaism, because we see that he is superior to the prophets, he's superior to the angels, he's superior to the man Moses. Now we've been looking at the fact that he's superior to the man Moses in a variety of ways. First of all, in relation uh, to the house that is built, and in relation to the rest that is offered, and now we're in the process of looking at the fact that he's superior in relation to the priesthood that is established, and we've looked at that already in the last session in chapters 5 and 6, and now we will conclude that section in relation to the priesthood that is established in all of chapter 7. Now, in chapter 7, we find that the quality of the Melchizedekan and the Aaronic priesthoods are compared. And uh, notice, first of all, in the first three verses of chapter 7, that the priesthood of Melchizedek is eternal, but that of Aaron is not. It, it was temporal. Now, notice, beginning in chapter 7 and in the first three verses, uh, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, for he's just stated in the latter part of chapter 6 that he's a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For this Melchizedek, being king of Salem, priest to the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham uh, gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually or perpetually. Now, what we want to see here is several things. First of all, the usage of the word Salem in verse 1. Now, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem. Now, Salem is Jerusalem. Uh, in ancient times, uh, Salem or Jerusalem was known as Jerus, J-E-R-U-S, which was taken from Jebus, J-E-B-U-S, and it was called that because it was the land of the Jebusites. Now, if you take off the ites, you just have Jebus. And so that is the reason it has this name. So Salem is Jerusalem. Now Jerusalem is called Salem in uh, Psalm 76 and verse 2. If we look back at that for just a moment. Psalm 76 and verses 1 and 2, the word says, In Judah is God known. His name is great in Israel. In Salem also is his tabernacle. Now, where was the tabernacle? It was in Jerusalem, in Salem, and his dwelling place in Zion. So we see here that he is speaking of the place of Jerusalem, king of Salem or king of Jerusalem, a priest of the Most High God. Uh, now, as Abraham was returning from the slaughter of the kings in that uh, war with Kedo Laomer, uh, we find that he would naturally have returned that way, going back to where he was dwelling. Uh, so he would have naturally returned through the area that is known as Jerusalem. Now, back in the book of Genesis, uh, back in Genesis chapter 14, back in Genesis chapter 14, we can see this information uh, rather clearly. Of that was taking place in verses 13 through 20. Now here uh, it is talking about this uh, Kiroleomer 
along with some other kings had gone into Sodom and other places and captured the people and what have you. And of course that took Lot because Lot was dwelling down in the plains of Sodom. And so Abram heard about it and so he gathered his private army together and went down to slaughter them and, and returned with the people. And that's when he was coming back through Salem or Jerusalem and met Melchizedek. Now, in verse 13 of Genesis 14, it says this, And there came one that had escaped. So one escaped from, from uh, this captivity and told Abram the Hebrew. For he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, a brother of Eschol, the brother of Aner, and these were uh, confederate with Abram. So they were friendly with him. And when Abram heard that, the br that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his uh, house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. So he had 318 men in his small army. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night, and smote them, and pursued them unto uh, Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods, and also brought again his brother Lot, and his goods, and the women also, and the people. So he took all of these people that had been taken captive and he brought them back. He recovered them. And the king of Sodom went out to meet uh, him after his return from the slaughter of, the, of Chedorlaomer and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shavai, which is the king's dale. Then notice what else happened here in verse uh, 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem brought forth bread and wine and he was the priest of the most high God. Now here other than in the book of Hebrews is our mention of the, of the Melchizedek as the priest of God in that day. And he blessed him that is he Melchizedek blessed Abraham and said blessed be Abram of the most high God possessor of heaven and earth and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him, that is, he, Abraham, gave Melchizedek tithes of all. So he gave him a tithe of everything that uh, he had taken in this uh, slaughter of those kings and the goods that he had brought back. So he gave him the best of all of those things. Now, back in our text, in uh, Hebrews chapter 7, and notice here, again, beginning in verse 1, this Melchizedek, king of Salem, or Jerusalem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abram returning from the slaughter of the kings, that which we just read. Now, and he blessed him, that is, Melchizedek blessed Abraham, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. He gave a tenth of all of the spoils that he had taken. First, being by interpretation, he was king of righteousness. That is, Melchizedek was king of righteousness. And after that also, king of Salem, which is king of peace. So he was a king of righteousness and he was a king of peace. Without father, without mother, without descent. That's not saying he did not have any. What it is saying here is there was no pedigree. There was no gene genealogy. Uh, he had no record of his descendants in any place. And so there was no record of those things without father, without mother, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. In other words, there was no record of his genealogy in any way. Uh, but made, or having been and being made, it's a perfect participle having been in men being made like unto the Son of God. Now notice, like unto the Son of God, not the Son of God. This was not a manifestation of Christ, but this was one who was a type of Christ. He abideth the priest continually or perpetually. Now, 
we find that he is made like to the Son of God. Melchizedek is not a manifestation of Christ. There are resemblances in the priesthood of Christ and Melchizedek, but not the same. He was a type of it. There's a resemblance in the name, King of Righteousness and King of Peace, so is Jesus Christ. In the fact that both had no ancestors nor successors in, nor successors in the priestly office. Now, no record of anyone prior nor to nor after Melchizedek being a priest. It is also true in the lineage of Christ. None before him. Also in the fact that both were, according to the record that we have in the scriptures, perpetual priests. Uh, there was a perpetuity of their existence in the priesthood. Also in the fact that both were united in the office of king and priest. Melchizedek was king, he was a priest. Christ is king, he is priest. So we have those things. Now, we see then the priesthood of Melchizedek is eternal. That of Aaron is only temporal. They're not the same. Now, notice, secondly, the priesthood of Melchizedek received tithes from the priesthood of Aaron. So, uh, we find that that makes the priesthood of Melchizedek much superior. Now look in verses 4 through 10. He says, Now consider how great this man was, that is, this man Melchizedek, uh, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils, that is, the best of the spoils. He gave a tenth part of the very best of what he'd taken when he took those kings. And verily or truly, uh, they that are of the sons of Levi. Now remember, it was the Levitical tribe that was made to be the priestly tribe in Israel. So he says, uh, here, and truly, they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of or from the people, according to the law that is, of their brethren. Now, they were to take the tithes and receive the tithes from all of Israel, and of course there was more than just one tithe in Israel, and we'll not take the time to go back into that, uh, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. Now, all of these, all of the Israelites, the Levitical tribe and all of the other tribes, they were descendants of Abraham. Now remember, there was Abraham, uh, who had the son, Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob had ten sons and two grandsons who became the, the head of the twelve tribes of Israel. Now the two grandsons were the sons of Joseph. Now, so he says, they all came out of the loins of Abraham. They were descendants of him. But he whose uh, descent is not counted from them received tithes of or from Abraham. So whose descent is not through them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. That is Melchizedek who received the tithes blessed Abraham who had received the promise from God. And without all contradiction, you can't contradict this, the less is blessed of or under the better. The word of here is the word hupo. He's blessed under the better. So Abraham was less than Melchizedek, and he says the Melchizedek who did the blessing was the better of the two. And here, here in this situation, men that die receive tithes. Here in this present Levitical system of Judaism, he says men that die receive tithes, but there, there in that situation with Abraham and Melchizedek, he received them of whom it is witness that he liveth. In other words, the witness is there's no record of his death, no record of his birth, no record of any descendants of any kind. He is a perpetual priest forever as a type of Christ. And as I may say, uh, Levi also, now get what he's going to say here. Levi also, who was the one that received tithes of the other Israelites under the law, uh, who received tithes, paid tithes, 
by means of or through Abraham. Now that word in is the word dia, by means of or through Abraham. How was that true? For he was yet in the loins of his father, that is, Abraham, when Melchizedek met him. So in this way, we find that all of the Israelites, including the Levites and the priestly office, they paid tithes to Abraham, who had given to a perpetual priest. So we see the priesthood of Melchizedek received tithes from the priesthood of Aaron. So that made them much superior. Then next, I want you to notice in verses 11 through 22, the priesthood of Melchizedek is perfect, that of Aaron is not. Now, notice he begins with a statement that is very obvious. If, therefore, perfection were by means of or through the Levitical priesthood, if one could be made perfect through that priesthood of the Levitical priesthood of Aaron and of Levi, uh, for under it the people received the law. That is, while under that priesthood, that's when they received the law. What further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek? Now this word another is the word another of a different kind. You have two words for another in your Greek language, another of the same kind, another of a different kind. So if perfection could have been through the Levitical priesthood, then what need was there for another priesthood to come along? Uh, what further need was there that another of a different kind of a priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? So the priesthood is the Levitical tribe and of the household and family of Aaron. For the priesthood being changed or being transferred, it was transferred over from the Levitical to that of the Melchizedekan priesthood, which is an eternal priesthood. There is made of necessity a change or a transfer also of the law. There was a transfer also of the law from the Levitical law to the law of grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now, notice he goes on to explain in verse 13. For he of whom these things are spoken, that is, Christ, who is our high priest now, he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another, another of a different tribe. That is, he was not of the tribe of Levi who were to be priests. Uh, he says, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. Now, Christ, of course, was of the tribe of Judah. And no one of the tribe of Judah ever served at the altar, but it was through the tribe of Judah that the Messiah was promised, who was, of course, Jesus Christ. So the one we're talking about here uh, is of another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident, it is obvious, that our Lord sprang out of Judah. That's what we have just stated. It's obvious that he came from the tribe of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. But he is a priest perpetually, continually, after the order of Melchizedek, and he is of the tribe of Judah. And it is yet far more evident or obvious for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, now after the likeness, similitude or likeness of Melchizedek, there rises another priest. So after the order of Melchizedek and his likeness who was perpetual and no one had been in the priesthood prior to him or no one of the descendant following him was in the priesthood. So there was a similarity of the two. There arises another priest who is made not after the law of carnal commandment, now, the commandments was carnal or fleshly. Uh, they, had, they dealt with our fleshly works. But after the power of an endless or an indissoluble life, a life that can never be dissolved or done away with, it'll never end. Uh, Christ will be endless, eternally there. So he says, but it was after the power of an endless life that we have it rather than a carnal fleshly commandment. 
for he testifieth. Now God made this testimony concerning Christ. Thou art a priest forever, that is, unto the ages, after the order of Melchizedek, that is, perpetually and eternally. Now, we're looking at the fact that the priesthood of Melchizedek is perfect and that of Aaron is not. It was temporal and fleshly. For there is truly a disannulling of the commandment that came along before. Now, because of this new priesthood in Christ, there is a disannulling of the commandments that came beforehand uh, by means of or through the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. In other words, that Old Testament law and that covenant was uh, weak, it was unprofitable, it did not make anything perfect. Now notice the parenthetical statement here about that. For the law made nothing perfect. It did not perfect anything. It was all typical, all representing the things in the life and the ministry of Christ himself who was that promised Messiah to be our high priest and our king. Now, but... He says, uh, but the bringing in of a better covenant did, or a better hope did, a better hope, an eager anticipation in Christ. Now that makes things perfect, by which we draw nigh unto God. Now through that, we can draw near unto God, not be fearful and draw back. Now, and inasmuch as not without oath-taking, without an oath, uh, inasmuch as not without oath-taking, he was made priest. For those priests, that is, those priests in the days of Levi and Moses, they were made without oath-taking. Now, they were made priests without an oath-taking, but this with an oath or oath-taking, by him that said unto him, now, who is that? That God himself that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent. He swore and he will not change his mind about it. And here's what he said concerning Christ. Thou art a priest forever. Thou art a priest unto the ages. After the order of Melchizedek. That is, perpetual, unending. You're a priest forever. By so much, was Jesus made, or Jesus has become a surety of a better testament or a better covenant. He's the surety of a much better covenant. Now, I want you to note here what he's mentioned several times through this passage that we've looked at, the unsatisfactory character of the Levitical priesthood and of the law. It was not something that was satisfactory that would make anything perfect or have the complete doing away of the, or of the passing over of sins. But now look with me in the book of Galatians for a moment. Galatians chapter 3, and we find a great deal, and the whole book of Galatians has to do with the thing of the law and makes it clear that law has nothing to do with our salvation or our life. It's all of grace from God. Now, I want you to notice in Galatians chapter 3, beginning in verse 15, what he has to say to us here in confirming further what we just saw there in Hebrews chapter 7, that the law was passed over, done away with, and it did not make anything perfect nor complete, but the bringing in of that better covenant did. Now, notice beginning in verse 15 of Galatians 3. Brethren, I speak after the manner of, of a man. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now, whatever a covenant or a contract you make, and it's agreed between the two, then you can't change it. That's it. Now, to Abraham and his seed. Now, this word seed is a singular word. Now, to Abraham and to the seed, singular of him, were the promises made. So the promises were not made to seeds, but to a seed singular. Uh, he saith not, and to seeds, plural, as upon the basis of many, the word of is epi, upon the basis of many, but as of or upon one, on the basis of one. Quote, 
and to thy seed, singular, which is Christ. So when God made the promise to Abraham of a seed, that seed was in the singular, and that seed referred to the person of Christ. Yes, there are other places where you said your seed and descendants would be as the stars of the sky and the sand of the seashore. That is, a heavenly seed and an earthly seed, and we see that even today. But now the seed promise singular was a singular, which is a promise of Christ the Messiah. And this I say, that the covenant, that is the covenant of the law that was confirmed before, that is that not the law, but the, the covenant that God made with Abraham that was confirmed before uh, under God uh, unto Christ the law, that is the law that came later, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. Now God made a promise to Abraham. 430 years later the law was given. And he said that law that was given later cannot disannul the promise that God gave to Abraham that it should make it of none effect. For if the inheritance be of or ek out of, out of the result of the law, it is no more out of the result of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by means of or through a promise. It was a promise that he gave it to him, and that was 430 years before the law was given. Wherefore then the law? Now the word serveth, notice, is in italics. It's added by the translators. It says, wherefore then the law? Why was the law given? Why is it there? It was added because of transgressions. <laughs> because of sin, the law was given to show us the exceeding sinfulness of our sin. Now, uh, it was given to show people that they were missing the mark before God concerning his moral standard. And how long was it given for? Till the seed should come. Who was the seed? Christ. Till the seed Christ should come, to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained, it was arranged or appointed, uh, by means of or through angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, or but, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. There's only one God. God is one. So is the law then against the promise of God? Does it contrary? Does it oppose it? Is it, it? is it contrary to the promise of God? God forbid. By no means perish such a thought. For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, then verily or truly righteousness should have been uh, out of the result of the law. It should have been out of the result of it, but it couldn't be. Righteousness could not come by. It. But the scripture hath concluded, that is, it has shut up together as a, as a jailer closes people up. The, the scripture hath concluded all under sin. All people are under sin that the promise out of the result of faith in Jesus Christ might be given to them who that believe. Those who are believing in Christ. But, he says, before the faith came, that is, before Christ came and that faith came, we were kept. That is, we kept in ward. We were guarded. We were shut up as one closed and guarded up in jail under the law. We were kept under that law shut up under the faith which should afterward or which was about to be revealed. So we were closed up until that time. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster. It was our pedagogue. It was our tutor, our teacher. Until Christ. So the law was our teacher and tutor even until Christ. That, Hena, purposive clause, in order that we might be justified or legally and judicially declared right or righteous uh, out of the result of faith. The word by is ek, out of the result of faith. But after that faith has come, now get this statement, it's very clear. We are no longer under a schoolmaster. We're no longer under a pedagogue, a tutor, a teacher. That is, we're no longer under the law since Christ has come. 
for you're all children of God. Literally, for you're all the sons of God by means of or through faith in Christ Jesus. The only way that we ever have a purification, a cleansing, and being perfected before God is through faith in Christ Jesus, the only way to be saved. Uh, for as many of you as have been baptized. Now the word baptized here has nothing to do with being immersed in water. The word baptized from the primitive root word bapto, which means to be placed in a new relationship. For as many of you as were placed in the new relationship into Christ, put on Christ. You did put on Christ. So here it makes it very obvious that we put on Christ by being placed into him through faith. There is neither Jew nor Greek. That is in Christ. There's not the distinction between a Jew and a Greek. There's not the distinction between a bond, bondman and a free man. That is, uh, uh, one that is bound in slavery or in prison or free. There is neither male and female. But you're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, if you belong to him, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to that same promise given unto him? So here we see the unsatisfactory character of the Levitical priesthood as was laid down for us in that portion of chapter 7 in the book of Hebrews. Now I want you to notice the last point in this. The priesthood of Melchizedek has a perfect and eternal priest and that of Aaron was not perfect and eternal in verses 23 through 28. Now, in verse 23 of Hebrews 7, it says, And they truly were many priests. There were many priests because they were not suffered or allowed to continue by reason of death. So there was many priests in the Levitical system because they grow old and die, and the next one grow old and die, and then, so they were replaced by others. But this man, this man Christ, because he continueth ever, or under the age, hath an unchangeable, has an unalterable priesthood. It never has to alter nor change. He continues because he exists eternally. Wherefore, because of that, he is able to save them to the uttermost. That is, to the completion, entirely, completely. He's able to save those completely and entirely that come unto God by means of or through him. When you come to God through Christ by faith, he says you're saved completely, entirely, to the very uttermost. Who come unto him, uh, unto God by means of or through him, seeing he ever liveth or is living to make and to continue to make intercession or intervention for them or for us. Now Christ is always there to intervene for us. He is interceding on our behalf. Whenever we may sin as a believer, there's Satan there to accuse the, the believers. But Christ is there as our attorney to say, Father, I died for that one too. He intercedes on our behalf. Now for such a high priest became us, he would be coming to us to have a priest like that who is holy. Uh, he is truly pious. He's holy. He's totally apart from sin. He's harmless. He's guileless. In other words, he's without any evil. He's free from malice and craft. Uh, there's an absence of all that is bad in the person of Christ. He is truly holy. He's guileless. He's undefiled. That is, he's stainless. He's untainted. Uh, he, he has an ethical cleanness about him. And further, he is separate from sinners. That is, he's in a class all by himself. We're all sinners. He's separate from us. He had a, the likeness of human flesh. This is stated more than one time in Scripture. But remember in likeness, asserts similarity but denies sameness. He had the total human flesh, but it was like that of Adam before Adam sinned. For in, indeed, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he is referred to as the second Adam. So he's separate from sinners and made 
or having become higher than the heavens, minds of higher state than we can imagine, who needeth not daily, he had no need to daily as those priests, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifice first for their own sins and then for the people's. You see, in the Levitical system, even the priests themselves had to offer sacrifice for themselves, for their sins, because they were imperfect. And then they offered sacrifices for the people. Christ didn't need to do that. For this he did once. That word once is the Greek word for once for all. He did once for all when he offered up himself. When he offered up is one word. It's an heiress participle, having offered up himself. He did it once for all, having offered up himself. When he offered himself up on the cross as the penalty for the sin of all humanity of all time from Adam till the end of time, then that one once for all sacrifice was sufficient. For the law maketh men high priest who have infirmities, who are imperfect. But the word of the oath or of the oath taking, which was since the law, that is, in Christ, maketh the Son, that is, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, maketh him a high priest who is having been in being. You have a perfect participle here. Who is having been in being consecrated or perfected forevermore or unto the age. Always perfected even unto the end. So what we're seeing here, these Jewish believers who are under severe persecution, therefore considering turning back to Judaism to alleviate the misery of the persecution. Uh, we see that they are, uh, they are encouraged to remain faithful in their Christianity because what they have in it is far superior to what they had in Judaism. He's superior to the prophets, he's superior to the angels, he's superior to the man Moses. He's superior to the man Moses in relation to the house that is built, in relation to the rest that is offered, in relation to the priesthood that is established. Now we saw that in relation to the priesthood that is established in 5, 1 through 7, 28. So in those three chapters we th see this fact. Now in our next session, we're going to see that he superior to the man Moses in relation to the covenant that is mediated. And that will cover chapters 8 and 9 and the first 18 verses of chapter 10, which will complete the first section of this epistle. Christ, the founder of Christianity, is, founder to the, is superior to the founders of Judaism, 1 1 through 10 18. We'll take that up in our next session.